But you also have a armor of righteousness, and we're to have it on the right hand and on the left hand. Now, when you get saved, you have Christ's righteousness imputed to you. I don't have any righteousness that will get me to heaven. Of my own, no righteousness of my own that would get me to heaven. The great doctrine of imputation means that God takes the very righteousness of Jesus Christ and imputes it to me when I trust Him as my Savior. By faith, His righteousness is imputed to me. You get the picture? And therefore, every believer can say that he stands with the righteousness of Christ. Not that he's done anything to deserve it. Not that he will ever deserve it. But God in His love has imputed Christ's righteousness to you. In the Old Testament, there were examples of that. When Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him. Now, not Christ's righteousness, but the example there was that righteousness was imputed, put to his account because he believed God. David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. That is, that God did not, in every case, take a man's iniquity and hold him accountable for it. If David had been held completely accountable for his sin, he would have been killed once he was exposed. Do you understand? Israel and many, many others uh, disobeyed God. And the, and the death penalty, according to the law, should have been followed up. But God showed righteousness, showed mercy to them, and their sins were not imputed to them as to the penalty. Now, I know David had a penalty. I know what it was. But he didn't have the penalty the law called for. And what about Solomon? I mean, if there ever was somebody that got involved in idolatry and led a nation into idolatry, it was Solomon. And yet, for David's sake, Solomon never was judged for his sins. Now, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and the nation, but their sins were not imputed to them. But that's only an example of imputation. And so the Lord took my sins and imputed them to Christ when Christ was on Calvary. He wasn't dying for his sins. He didn't have any. He had absolutely no sins. He had no reason to die on his own, of his own uh, doings. But your sins were imputed to him. And you and I have no righteousness except His imputed righteousness. And it's been put to your account when you trust Jesus as your Savior. And by the way, that's why a man must trust Christ as his Savior if he's ever going to heaven. You cannot be saved without His righteousness. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. So you can join all the churches, do all the good works, do everything good, join every charitable organization. You can help people. You can give money, you can sing, you can serve, you can, you can go to India like Mother Teresa, you can do any of that. But if you don't have Jesus Christ's righteousness, you're not going to heaven. And by the way, that's not a Baptist doctrine. Martin Luther believed that doctrine. He was a Roman Catholic, got saved. You know how the Lutherans came about, don't you? Martin Luther was a, was a Catholic monk. He said, if any man could be saved through monkery, he would have been saved. <laughs> now, he loved the Catholic Church. He didn't hate the church. He tried to reform the church. Luther was going up the, the steps, doing penance, going up the steps on his knees, kissing the steps, and meditating on the Word of God to, to merit grace to get to heaven. And while he was doing that, a verse of Scripture came to his mind from the book of Romans, the just shall live by faith. And God illuminated that thing in his mind, and he said, I went back to my study like a madman tearing through the Scriptures. And God began to open it up, that a man is saved by faith and not by works. And that's how the Lutheran church got started, from a Roman Catholic monk. See? So, we don't want folks blaming the Baptists for the doctrine of imputation and justification by faith, right? But we believe it. And so righteousness has been imputed to you. 
And that's enough to shout about. That's enough to rejoice about. When you understand these wonderful truths, that your standing before Him is perfect, and it's not because of anything you've done. It's because of His grace. And so we're to put on, you'll notice, this armor of righteousness. But notice it's something that we're to put on. Therefore, listen carefully, it's not the imputed righteousness that I can put on. But this must be a righteous behavior, I think. I think it's talking about uh, a, a righteousness in our behavior. It means to live right. I mean... Job didn't have the righteousness of Christ, but he was a righteous man. You do know that, don't you? Why, he was called righteous. Noah was a righteous man. In fact, I'll just really throw you a curve. Did you know Lot was a righteous man? <laughs> Most folks didn't know it. But he's called, the book of Hebrews says, that righteous man vexed his righteous soul with their unlawful deeds. So there is a righteousness of Christ that Im that's imputed to every sinner who believes, and that is the imputed righteousness that saves us. But you have a responsibility as a Christian to work and live a righteous life. That's a life that's right. On the right hand and on the left hand. You understand why? <laughs> it's called being honest. You know? not having, doing one thing here and have a shady hand over here. Being righteous. That's the armor of righteousness. And so the Christian is to have on the armor of light, and he's to have on the armor of righteousness. And then thirdly, he's to have on the armor of God. We read about it here in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, put on the whole armor of God. And by the way, when the word whole is used here, it's talking about the complete and the entire thing, and it's for... It's for warfare, and uh, it's all for, also for, uh, you know, for defense and offense. And God provides this armor. And you'll notice down in verse 14, it's called the girdle of truth. That would be the armor of light, wouldn't it? It's called the truth. The truth, the armor of truth. Look at verse 14 again. It says, The breastplate of righteousness, having righteousness on the right hand and on the left hand. So it's one thing to have the imputed righteousness of Christ, but it's another thing that a Christian is to put on something in his Christian life, in his daily life. You'll notice he's to put on gospel shoes in verse 15. Now evidently that is taking the gospel, witnessing, missionary work, evangelistic work, soul winning, telling people about Christ. And uh, you'll notice in verse 16, the first part of it, it's called the shield of faith. Faith is a victory. And it's a shield. And this shield, of course, uh, shields come in all sizes, as we've said. And the reason for that is so that they can be used where they ought to be used. And uh, you notice with that shield of faith, you can quench all the fiery darts of the devil. The shield of faith will take care of devil, the devil's attacks. Verse 17, it's a helmet of salvation. Now that may be having the assurance of salvation. I don't know. It may just be meditating on the great doctrines of salvation, but whatever it is, it protects the mind. You get the picture? And it's something you put on, and it's something a Christian puts on. But you put on a helmet of salvation. And now Lotus in 17, the last part of verse 17, called the sword of the Spirit. And that sword of the Spirit is the Bible. It's called the Word of God. And I believe that's why it's so important for Christians to memorize Scripture. You either ought to memorize Scripture, or you ought to read the Bible so much, you just automatically, uh, it will automatically come to your mind. Dr. Ruckman told me, he says, I don't, I don't memorize Scripture. But he said, you name any subject and I can find it in 30 seconds in the Bible. I can find you the verse. Because he's read the book through four or five hundred times, I guess. Well, you read a book through that much pretty soon. I mean, you don't have to consciously memorize it. It's just going into your brain. You, you know what I mean? And so it's just there. 
One time we was coming from the airport, and he told me, he says, you know what? 200, th 200 times through the Bible really messes you up for this whole world. That's what he said. Amen. He said, you don't fit. You don't fit. How do you fit? I mean, how would you fit in this world if your mind was absolutely saturated with the Word of God? <laughs> you think about that for just a moment. Think of how you'd look at things differently. Everything would look different to you. I mean, you'd weigh everything you hear, everything you see, everything you think in the, in the light of the Word of God. That'd drive you mad, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so, this armor is for the sword of the Spirit. It's to take the Word of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And uh, so you've got the shield of faith here, and you've got the sword of the Spirit here. And one is to respond. Actually, both of them are defensive weapons, but they're both offensive weapons as well. And then last of all in verse 18 is supplication. It's prayer. Now each piece of this armor was designed to make the Christian victorious over Satan. And it is provided, but it must be procured. It must be it must be apprehended and put on by the child of God. It's something, as I said earlier, that we do. Verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 11 again. This word wiles means deceit. It has to do with, it's kind of like a fellow, um, uh, like a card game. <laughs> Or uh, it's trickery. Do you ever see the guy take the, the nut under the cup and keep moving them around or throwing the, moving the cards around, you know? It's a sleight of hand. And it has to do with uh, the, the, uh, the wiles here means to the deceit or the trickery uh, and he, how he lies in wait uh, for, for you as a child of God. And he's waiting to see how he can trick you and deceive you. And believe me, he can. Believe me. Now, he does that in three ways. If you'll go to, first, go to John's Gospel, go to John chapter 2 and verse 16. I think that's 1 John. I want, <clears throat> let me just check here. 1 John, I think it's 1 John chapter 2, I know it is. 1 John 2.16, yes. 1 John 2.16, not the Gospel of John. Is it uh, for all that is in the world? Yeah. Notice it says, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but of the world. And so there are three ways the devil tries to trick God's people. And he tries to do it, of course, through appetite. Notice he calls it the lust of the flesh. And these are appetites. And uh, these are things that, that we desire that are forbidden. Now, appetites, there are God-given appetites. There are God-given appetites. There are things that, uh, that, you know, like for food, you have, a, have an appetite for them. But what the devil does is he takes the God-given appetites and he distorts them and perverts them to where we lust after things that we should not, and then those things take us into bondage. See? And it's called the lust of the flesh. And uh, has to do with bodily appetites. And uh, they can be for fame. It could be for money. Uh, it could be for power. Uh, could be anything. But these are the things the devil uses to get the child of God sidetracked. Away from having an appetite for God himself. David said, my soul thirsteth for the living God. And Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
David, uh, the writer said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. He said, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation day and night. So we ought to have an appetite for God. We ought to have an appetite for God's Word. Paul talked about those in the book of Acts who addicted themselves to the ministry. And that's what you ought to do. You ought to get to where you have an appetite for church, where you have an appetite for the Bible, where you have an appetite for fellowship with God's people and with the Lord Jesus Himself. But he takes these appetites and he distorts them. And then pretty soon we're crying out for those things that are against God. And that's how he deceives us. It's trickery. Taking the good things and he distorts them until he has captured us. Um, the only way we can overcome that is to walk in the Spirit. The second thing here is, is appearance. Appearance. Notice he says that all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. And uh, what God does, or what the devil does, is he deceives us into thinking that we will be happy if we see things. I think, was it Brother Bard was talking about folks traveling all around the world and looking at this and looking at that and looking at that, you see. And it's, you know, it worries me that when folks get to be senior citizens and they just want to go see the world, but they forget all about God. And they forget going to church. They don't go to church anymore. They don't have a church anymore. don't have any responsibility anymore. They're just going to go look at things. Say. Now, they're not bad things. They want to go see the world. Right? I mean, you know, really, there are folks that way. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with seeing, but this lust of the eye, if we're not careful, is a trick of the devil to get us out of church and to get us out of our Bible and to get us away from serving God. And you see, I mean, you can't say anything bad about somebody wanting to go to the mountains and see the mountains and see God's creation and go to Mount Rushmore and go to, the, go to any of these places. But when these things take us away from our church and away from God's service and away from God's people, we have been deceived by a good thing. And that is the, you know, that's the deception. If it was obvious, nobody would fall for it. But it's called the lust of the eye. You know, that's how Eve fell into sin. She just saw something that was pleasant to the eye. That's it. Just pleasant. But it became more pleasant than obeying God, and it led to her temptation. And there are many beautiful, wonderful things that in themselves, there's not a thing in the world wrong with them. But if you're not careful, they will get you away from God and away from serving God and away from helping other people. And sad to say, many times when folks retire, they don't want to help people anymore. They don't want to teach a Sunday school class anymore. They don't want to witness anymore. They don't want to hand out tracts anymore. They don't want to be faithful in any local church. They just want to just be, you know, like a bird, you know. Are you out there? That goes on all the time. I see it constantly. You know. There's this lust of the eye. Now certainly, if you remember Achan, how many of you know who Achan was? Okay, a few of you, okay. Well, you remember when Joshua brought the children of Israel across uh, the Jordan, the first city they were to take was Jericho. And they took that city, and then, and they took it without a fight. And so God told them, He says, Now, when you go in, you don't, don't take any of the spoil for yourself and all that kind of stuff. And there was a fellow by the name of Achan. He saw, he said, I saw a goodly Babylonian garment, a wage of gold, and there was something else. I forget what it was. And he said, I took, I saw it, I coveted it, and I took it. I saw it, I coveted it, and I took it. And he said, it's hid in my tent. And uh, you know what happened to Mr. Aiken and his family? 
So certainly there's the lust there. He saw this wage of gold while there probably was tons of it. And then just a garment out of Babylon. But his lust of the flesh caused him to forget about God. And for a moment he thought that getting this was more important than obeying God. And we think that. We think that for the moment this is more important. And that's how the devil tricks us. We sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of today. David, if you remember David, one of the greatest kings that ever lived. And he was on a housetop. The houses were flat over there, you know. And, and uh, they had, you know, they had flat houses. And sometimes they had bath houses up there. And sometimes there was chairs where people would sit and they would uh, talk. And David saw a woman bathing. And he lusted after her, and he was king, and he said, I want her. And he took her, and he got her pregnant. And when she, the news got to him that, uh, that she was pregnant, he sent messages to the general to see to it that Bathsheba's wife, her husband, got killed. He thought he would cover his sin. He should have been in the battle himself, <laughs> see? And... Uh, but he, he lusted through his eye, and uh, it led to his death, and led to the death of many of his children. Remember what got Lot into trouble? Well, here Lot was the nephew of Abraham. He had, the, he, had the, he had the greatest potential of any young man that ever lived. Why, he was with Abraham. And as long as he would have stayed under Abraham's shadow, he would have been a blessed forever. But a little squabble came between their herdsmen, and a Abraham said, Look, we don't need to squabble about anything. You go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You make the decision. And Lot looked toward Sodom, and it said it looked like gar the Garden of Eden. And he, he selfishly took the best. He coveted it, the lust of the eye. And he moved down there, and guess what he moved in next door to? A bunch of sodomites. And that was the end of him, the end of his wife, and the end of his kids, and the end of that city, which ought to be a wake-up call to everybody. You understand? Don't kid yourself. Now, you may legislate something, but <laughs> God hasn't legislated. God's already legislated it to hell. The third thing is the devil not only... The devil not only uh, deceives us through his wiles of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye, but also through arrogance. Notice there in 1 John it says that it's all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. The pride of life. And... Did you know what Eve, when, when it says that when she looked at this tree of life, she saw that it was to make one wise, that it was good for the sight and desired to make one wise. In other words, she wanted to know something that she was not, that she was forbidden to know. You see? And God has set boundaries. There are some things that you should never know did you know that? There are things you should not know. Aren't there things you don't want your children to know? Aren't there things you wouldn't want your children to know? Well, there's things God doesn't want His children to know. He wants them to know by faith, if you eat this, you'll die. I mean, if a kid gets bit by a rattlesnake, they could die, right? Well, I guess you don't want them to get bitten, do you? You want them to know what the consequences will be, but you don't want them to know by experience. The devil says God's just trying to keep you in darkness. See, that's his trick. How can you know if you don't get your eyes open? For the God doth know in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. You see the lie? And think of all the people, and think of yourself, how many times you've had your eyes open to things that you wish you'd never had them open to. Right? Yeah. Sure. We all have things we wish we'd have never seen, never heard. See? 
to. Because we're not any better off. In fact, we're worse off. And so, but pride says we have to investigate this. We have to know this. And so people want to know things that are forbidden. God says, no, you won't be better off if you know this. You'll be worse off. And the devil says, well, that's just a lie. For God doth know in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and now you will be like God's, and you can decide if you want to do it or not. You get the picture? And that's the way, that's the way he works. Dr. Harold Seitler said that the devil... The lust of the flesh takes over in our youth. The lust of the eye takes over in midlife. And the pride of life takes over when we're in old age. Now that may or may not be true. I find that they all take over at all the time, don't you? God provides the whole armor because the wiles of the devil. Let me just hurry up here in Ephesians chapter 2. If you'll go back to Ephesians chapter 6, not 2, but in Ephesians chapter 6, and look down about verse 12. You see, the truth is that we're in a wrestling match. Hey, Christian, did you ever wonder why the most spiritual thing you can do is the most difficult thing to do? Now think about it. You know it's really not difficult to come to church on Thursday night at 6 o'clock and eat supper. I really don't have to struggle with that at all. Now, I know some of you, your schedule may interfere. But if, you're, if your schedule was free at 6 o'clock, do you think it would be a real struggle to come down and sit down at a table and, and just enjoy all that food? That's really not a battle, is it? The battle comes later. But that's not a battle. And you know, getting up Sunday morning and coming to the 11 o'clock hour is really not the end of the world. You can manage that. Well, you can sleep in till 10.45, and if you hurry, you come in about 11.15, uh, or maybe a little after the offering, but you can manage. You can do it. So think about it. You could get, you could get eight or ten hours sleep and still make it for the 11 o'clock before the preaching starts, about 20 or 25.